director of the uh, Global Awareness Lecture Series and welcome you to the uh, first program in our series uh, uh, this year. And we're privileged to uh, have with us uh, tonight uh, Professor uh, Jason Lindsay from our sister school, St. Cloud State uh, University, where he is the chair of the uh, Department of Political Science. Um, he's been with us before, um, several years ago, to give uh, a talk on uh, um, another subject in the arena of uh, uh, the post-Soviet Union. Um, tonight, um, we are uh, going to hear from him um, on the subject of uh, Putinism, uh, uh, Russia's political dead end, and he's a, uh, a very, very well uh, published scholar to, uh, to do this. Uh, just a couple of things from his resume, uh, his bachelor's degree in political science and the Russian language from the University of Alabama, uh, Tuscaloosa. Um, PhD in political science uh, and political theory and comparative politics at uh, Columbia uh, University in New York, which always was one of the uh, great places that you went to study about uh, um, what was then the Soviet Union and the, our key rival in the, in the world. It was one of the places that uh, I considered going as a, for, as a graduate student. Uh, so he, he went to that wonderful place and um, that helped him prepare for the work that he has done. Um, he travels often uh, to this part of the world, and uh, this coming uh, spring semester he will be a Fulbright Scholar uh, teaching at the National Law Academy in, uh, in Kharkov in, uh, in the Ukraine. Uh, if you were a watcher of the European Football Championships, you saw some games from there this summer. Um, he'll be in that wonderful city. Um, but tonight uh, he's with us to uh, talk about uh, some of the political developments as they are in, um, in contemporary Russia. So he's going to talk for about 45 minutes uh, with slides and the like, and then we'll entertain your questions uh, after that. So Jason, the, the floor is yours. Thanks, Gary. I think that, yeah, okay. Thank you, Gary. Uh, since I'm originally from Alabama, in the socialization you get there, it's verboten to talk about yourself. So thanks, Gary, for saying nice things about me. When I have a captive audience, uh, you know, people want to know what's going on in Russia. So that's always a huge question for me because it's a big place and it's a big topic and I'm still learning all the time about the culture there, the society and things. But um, in the short time I have with you, I wanted to try and give you kind of my view of what's going on in Russian politics right now. And part of this talk came out of me being asked quite often, why are you going to Ukraine so much now? And why are you interested in doing a Fulbright Scholar to Ukraine? Because you've spent all this time in Russia. And I would say to people, well, in Ukraine, politics are more fluid. There's more stuff going on. There's movement. Uh, whereas Russia is so locked up at the moment. And they'd say, well, what do you mean locked up? What, what are you talking about? And that's kind of the genesis of, of this talk. But um, I would say that to understand really what's going on right now in Russia with Vladimir Putin, you need to think about political ideology, which is one of the other subjects I teach. And I would argue the roots of what's going on now lie in the last presidential campaign, believe it or not, of Boris Yeltsin in 1996. And 1996, Boris Yeltsin had been in power in Russia for five years, really, un untrammeled power since 1991. The economy had collapsed on his watch. Uh, reforms that Yeltsin had pushed through on the advice of his own advisors, plus um, a lot of Western advisors brought in trying to figure out how to restart the economy, led to widespread poverty and, and upheaval. So he faced an election and a lot of his advisors in the Kremlin, a lot of people at the top in Russian politics feared he would lose. And his rivals in 96 was a challenger from the kind of left of Russian politics and the right. 
And a lot of his advisors feared that he would lose power and the election would have to be conceded to a sort of radical challenge from right or left. There had been various attempts to create a political party tied to Yeltsin, a so-called party of power that had failed repeatedly. Uh, there were various experiments tried, I won't bore you with all of them, three or four different brands were trotted out and different politicians were put in charge of it, but they were unelectable. They could not win fair elections and get a majority in the legislature. So the question became what to do. Some of Yeltsin's advisors argued for postponing the elections in 1996, including this fellow, Korzhakov, who had been a close advisor to Yeltsin and his bodyguard. In this famous picture where Yeltsin gave his speech on the tank during the 1991 coup, Korzhakov's the guy standing next to him who at times tries to kind of stand in front of him and stuff, but trying to shield him a bit. But Korzhakov argued that Yeltsin should declare a state of emergency and tell the West and international powers that he has no choice but to declare a state of emergency, suspend the Constitution, and he argued it could be sold to the U.S. and others as preventing the communists from coming back to power or preventing extreme nationalists from coming to power. And it was also argued it could be sold as continuing economic reform as suggested by kind of the neoliberal advice he was getting. Instead, though, kind of wiser heads prevailed, and these two sort of close associates of Yeltsin, Anatoly Chubayas and Yeltsin's daughter, Tatyana Dechenko, who was a close advisor to her dad, they instead went to the so-called business oligarchs in Russia. And these were people who had made a lot of money through the privatization schemes to get the state economy into private hands, they were people who had become really wealthy through gaining control of what had been state enterprises and turning them into private enterprises or quite often taking a state enterprise which you bought at a reduced rate, chopping it up and selling it to German and other foreign capitalists, you know, make money. But these business folks had made a lot of money. Jubias and other advisors to Yeltsin go to them and say, look, if Yeltsin loses this election in 96, the left or the right's going to come into office and what's going to be popular is hauling you guys into court and investigating all these business deals and your taxes and how you made money. Oh, and by the way, how did you have money in 1991 to begin with to buy up all these companies? You know, how did someone who used to work for the Soviet state get millions of dollars in 1991 to suddenly buy up privatized state firms? So they kind of held this threat out to them. And so these business interests bought up a lot of time. Yeltsin also pulled off one of his miraculous comebacks. He's, he doesn't get the credit in the West for the miracle politician he often was. When he was bad, he was down and out, but when he was on key, He's one of the best politicians you've ever seen, one of the naturals. But he, he pulls it out. He famously dances at this rock concert to show his health during the campaign. There have been all these rumors about how unhealthy he was. He got on stage, danced a little bit. But more importantly, uh, a precedent gets set. Basically, Yeltsin's advisors say, we cannot risk a fair election. The fate of the country is at stake. We cannot risk him losing. And so these business interests buy up media outlets. They either pay for better coverage of Yeltsin, or if they can't buy off journalists, they just buy the newspaper outright and bring in new editorial staff and start trying to improve his coverage. And so you get this precedent that the elites in government in 96 basically decide they can't risk an open election they start pouring money into media coverage in Russia or buying media outlets to provide the government better coverage before the election. election. And these euphemisms start appearing in Russian political speech, administrative resources and political technologies. In other words, the kind of skullduggery, right, <laughs> that we have in most democratic systems, but uh, with some differences. <clears throat> if you think about election tinkering in the U.S. 
hypothetically. Florida, North Jacksonville in 2000, for example. The, what you're looking at, though, are instances where local officials and local party members, you know, representatives of a political party, get, uh, you know, sort of accused of trying to throw out ballots or have ballots discounted from particular areas of the county or something like that. What we have here instead is the, you start getting this introduction of direct pressure from state officials. So in more recent elections in Russia, we've seen Moscow State students go to vote in the polling center on the Moscow State campus. And there's basically this message put out that, well, you need to come vote, and surely you'll know who to vote for. And people that don't vote are not going to be at the top of the line to get a dorm room in the fall. <laughs> so we're not talking about kind of party officials, you know, tinkering with absentee ballots here. We're talking about uh, you know, members of the state kind of putting direct pressure on people trying to improve turnout or trying to put pressure on people to vote. Uh, gradually, too, you've seen in Russia the centralization of the electoral commission so that, um, I mean, this is simplifying it a bit, but the voting gets done in all these different areas of Russia. It goes into a centralized counting system with the Federal Election Commission of Russia. And then one big computer or set of computers cranks out the official tally in Moscow. <laughs> you know. and, um, but this is the precedent that gets set under Yeltsin. So basically the election then, what I'm saying is, was not that fair in 96, clearly. There was a lot of... Uh, media bias, and there seems to have been outright fraud in some areas. Yeltsin, though, is so ill that his associates, even after this happened, they start to ask themselves, what happens after Yeltsin? What do we do? You know, he can't be president forever. And I think this is another precedent that gets established in the Russian political system after the Soviet Union. You don't have a systematic sort of turnover of power. Instead, Yeltsin begins to look for a successor. And the joke becomes that it's the operation successor, that he's trying to find someone to replace him. Yeltsin had had a lot of different prime ministers, but suddenly he appointed Putin prime minister in the late 90s. And under the Russian constitution, there was no, from 93, there was no vice president. If the president was incapacitated or had to resign, the prime minister becomes acting president. Well, also under the Russian constitution, the president nominates the prime minister. The prime minister is confirmed by a vote in the state, in the, in the parliament, but there's a lot of administrative pressure the president can apply to make that happen. So Putin is picked by Yeltsin to be his prime minister. Putin's not a member of the legislature. He's not, a, he's not elected to office. You have to understand that, too. He is in the government. He's a bureaucrat in the state bureaucracy. Yeltsin nominates him to be prime minister, and he persuades the legislature to approve him. Um, the late Lilia Shasova, um, Russian journalist uh, who died a number, was murdered a number of years ago, she did a lot of uh, work on Putin. I, I don't think that's related to her murder, but she did a lot of work on Putin's background and things. Uh, Shetsova thinks that uh, one of the important things was that Yeltsin's family and his advisors felt they could trust Putin. Putin basically promised Yeltsin that as he left office, Putin would give him a presidential pardon for any kind of accusations lingering over what he'd done. And Putin sort of guaranteed that the office of the presidency would be respected, that Yeltsin would be able to retire as a former head of state and you know, not be hauled back in on charges in court or something like that from his political enemies. Yeltsin resigned on Russian TV New Year's Eve 1999. I watched it on state television. I was in Latvia at the time. And Vladimir Putin became acting president. Well, <clears throat> this is a lot of history to unpack, I know, but it's important to understand kind of how Putin came to power 
and where his initial popularity came from. And his initial popularity came in part from the fact that he was not Yeltsin. <laughs> he was a younger, healthier person than Yeltsin, and he immediately started cultivating this image in the media that he was everything sort of Yeltsin was not. And one of his famous things he staged in 2000 was he flies down to Chechnya in the back seat of a two-seater fighter jet. Uh, there had been a lot of unre there had been um, violence and fighting in Chechnya. He flies in and gets out and says, "I'm here on the spot. I'm going to find out what's going on and get to the bottom of it." Uh, a lot of images appeared of him in the media doing judo. He does have an interest in it. He studied judo for a number of years, but trying to show him as a very active, vigorous person. He also promised to do things that he said Yeltsin had failed to do. Uh, one of the things he promised was to take decisive action in Chechnya. He also announced what he called a dictatorship of the law. In other words, a crackdown on corruption in Russia, which he said had gotten out of control on Yeltsin's watch. He said he would defend Russia's natural, uh, national interests much more firmly in the world, and he said he would improve the economy. So he basically makes these election promises. He does not get enough credit in the West for being a talented um, politician. And a lot of times people are surprised to hear me say that, but if you watch him sometime do his two-hour phone-in interview thing where people call in and do questions with him, he's actually quite good. He's good with a crowd in Russia. He's actually quite talented when he wants to, you know, uh, politic there. And Putin, sorry I couldn't help, but, uh, I like to throw in the, so many statues of him, but he says he's going to use the state to stabilize the society. And one of the things Putin argued about when he came into power was he said on Yeltsin's watch, business interest had become too dominant, the state was weak, uh, state power was not being used to defend the national interest, and he complained that the regions of Russia were doing their own thing and starting to almost pull away from the central government. And, and he had a point. I mean, when Putin comes to power in 2000, there are some regions of Russia that at that point were refusing to contribute to the national budget. Tatarstan had started issuing its own passports. I mean, there had been a lot of diffusion of power. And this becomes one of Putin's sort of planks of his power and of what we could maybe think of as Putinism. He says he's going to strengthen the vertical of power. So he complains that on Yeltsin's watch in the 90s, there had been this diffusion of power across the country. The regions were starting to drift away. He's going to come in and stabilize the state and strengthen the vertical of power instead and use the state administration to grapple with various policy issues. And again, why am I telling you all this? Because one of the problems I think the current regime in Russia has is it has not developed an ideology that appeals to a lot of the citizenry there. The only kind of ideology to Putinism are sort of these basic things I'm talking about here that came in with him in 2000. He has not articulated something much broader than that, I don't think, and that's leading to problems there. And it's kind of strange from a U.S. perspective. We often feel we've got too much ideology in our politics, right, or lately. But in a way, Russia doesn't have perhaps enough ideology at the moment. And the absence of strong political parties there, for example, and if some of you guys are political science majors, they've been telling you that in a federal system, in a political, you need political parties to help coordinate things. Putin, over time, has come to rely instead on a group, group known as the Soloviki and, um, and the Administration for Support. The Soloviki would be, we can loosely translate it as hawks, but it comes from the word power for the power ministries. So Putin has increasingly, over time, promoted into government and relied on to get policy done people with backgrounds such as himself. There are people from the um, Federal Security Service, the FSB, which is the successor to the old Soviet secret police. 
people from the interior ministry, defense, and so forth. And they have professional backgrounds very similar to Putin. That's not as sinister as sometimes the New York Times and others make it out to be, because in the late Soviet period, uh, those types of agencies often attracted a lot of the most talented professionals going into sort of state work. Um, I was an exchange student many years ago in 1991, 92 at the State Institute of International Relations in Moscow. And uh, the KGB came and did a sales pitch every year trying to recruit students from there who spoke foreign languages, who had training in law, who had training in accounting and economics and things to do all this analysis they wanted. Um, an American friend and I put our names down to go hear the sales pitch. <laughs> And the, the guy from the foreign student group came and said, no, you guys are not, the Americans are not allowed to go hear the KGB recruitment talk. And I said, but I've got a lot to offer the KGB. <laughs> you know, future, right? Didn't work. But so, so uh, Putin relying on such people is it's not such a sinister thing if you think about it in that context. But it does indicate that he doesn't have a political party to reach out to. He doesn't have a group of professional politicians to reach out to. Instead, his solution over the years has been to promote these sort of people into the state bureaucracy and then rely on them to deal with policy problems in Russia. And that shows kind of this weakness in the political system. Putin cannot rely on power from below so he relies on this state bureaucracy to get things done. If you think about it in the United States context, if President Obama wants to find out what's going on politically on the ground in California, he can reach out to the Democratic Party, right? If he doesn't trust the governor for some reason, <laughs> or if the governor of the state was from a different party, he could reach out to his own party. President Putin wanting to find out what's going on in Vladivostok 10 time zones away doesn't really have a party to reach out to. He has instead a state administration to try and find out what's going on and to rely on. So although Putin appears to be really tough to a lot of people and more in charge, I think arguably there's a lot of continuity still with the failed sort of Soviet state. He spent 12 years trying to strengthen the state and build the state up, but we don't really see still a party of power. Yeltsin never could create one, and as I'll talk about, Putin hasn't been able to. We don't see a really robust political system with parties fighting it out over policy. Instead, we've got this kind of shoring up of the state that Putin's engaged in, and he relies on across the you know, in, in various policy areas. So the West increasingly sees Putin as this sort of authoritarian figure, but kind of perversely, what you've got really still is a fairly weak political system. And in a lot of ways, it's kind of frustratingly going back to a kind of criminology you used to have in the Cold War period. When the Soviet Union fell, a lot of people were like, oh, this is going to be great. It's going to be a regular political system study, there's going to be parties, there's going to be all this stuff that's going to be open and things. But instead, what's slowly developed is again a kind of elite politics where to find out what's going on in Russia, you have to study sort of Putin, who's around him, who's got influence with him, which group around him has the most influence on what topic. And it's, again, a kind of elite politics. It's not a closed system like the old Soviet one, certainly not but it is uh, still a weak state in a lot of ways. Among Putin's Soloviki, there has been a kind of governing ideology that's developed. And this fellow, Viktor Chirsikov, wrote an infamous uh, opinion piece for Russian newspaper Kommersant in October of 2007. In 2007, the question was, what will Putin do next year? Because under the Russian constitution, he served two four-year terms. Well, the Russian Constitutional Court was asked the hypothetical question, what if someone who served two four-year terms under the Constitution sat out of period and then ran again? And the Constitutional Court analyzed this question and said, well, 
Uh, we think the Constitution is saying you can only serve two uh, successive term, uh, two back-to-back -back terms. It doesn't say you can't run again later. <laughs> Twenty-one justices on the Russian court. Seventeen appointed by Putin. So, it's a fact. So, the question in 2008 became, okay, so under the Constitution he cannot serve a third term, but is he going to try to come back right after sitting out a period and this was this big debate well around this time a number of the Soloviki and the government seemed to have a big falling out and it was starting to get public that there was a lot of arguments around Putin about what should be done Chersikov publishes amidst that background this op-ed piece where he says that the Soloviki or the kind of elite need to get it together and he says that, you know, during the Yeltsin years, the country was very weak because the Soviet collapse and business interests became dominant. They ignored the national interest. So he said Putin had to turn toward patriots, reliable people, people he could trust, people who were not just captured by narrower business interests. And he used those patriots to reverse this decay. And he argues in this piece, and this seems to be an opinion a lot of people around Putin have, that this elite running the country have to develop the country from above. And uh, another associate of, of Vladimir Putin, uh, Vasily Kirchhoff, has argued that the folks around Putin are kind of like the Park regime in South Korea in the 70s, building the state from above. Uh, other people associated with him have compared Putin to Pinochet in Chile. But there's this idea that, amongst the elite, there's this idea that the, the country's not ready for open elections, the country's not economically developed enough for that, and so it has to be led by a state sort of building from above. For the citizenry, though, that political elite, I would argue, has failed to come up with an ideology that reaches out to kind of the voter. I think it's pretty clear that around Putin, the people he trusts the most buy into this idea that they're directing the country from above for the good of the country. But that hasn't really appealed to people much. Um, Putin launched another party of power. It's called United Russia, Yedinia Russia. And there have been various attempts to to sort of campaign around this idea that Putin has some sort of plan. This is Putin's plan uh, for one of the campaigns, but it never really gets developed very far. Uh, initially, this plan seemed to be building these big infrastructure projects that were going to help the country out, but that quietly sort of drops out of the picture in part because the economy there is very tied to raw materials. Oil prices are up, when natural gas is up, the economy is doing quite well. Uh, when raw materials are lower, the economy becomes more volatile. So these various attempts to sort of say that the voter voting for Putin's voting for some kind of idea has not translated over well to the electorate. Um, there have been all these stunts. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Putin's become kind of internationally famous now for these sort of stunts where he's showing, you know, how in charge he is and how healthy he is. And, you know, he's a healthy guy for his age and stuff, and he clearly is a really, you know, robust character. But after a while, it's starting to lose its charm, you know. I mean, in the 2000s when he would do this, he was still contrasting himself to Yeltsin, you know. And there was that immediate path. Well, now there's a lot of people voting in Russia for whom Yeltsin's something that happened when they were a kid, right? Or, you know, something, you know, they don't even remember, hardly. Um, you know, and, and it doesn't make much sense. Most recently, he did this, this bit with the cranes where he flew the ultralight in Siberia to guide the cranes. And so this political cartoon emerged where he's telling the cranes, let's get this straight, I'm the alpha crane. You know, you're going to follow, I'm the alpha crane for you to follow. So even, you know, even with a lot of kind of everyday folks there, it's becoming less popular. Um, recently, a, 
a, a reliable political opinion poll in Russia, it was published in Novaya Gazeta, the new newspaper, uh, found that Putin had support from the electorate of about 48 percent. Well, that would be good for an American politician, right, in an open election system. But if you're kind of the ruler or the strong man, 48 percent's not really that great, you know, if, if, if the system totally depends on, on you in that sense. So I think everybody in Russia kind of knows or accepts to some degree that, well, you've got sort of a form of elite politics. If, I think in political science we'd argue it's a kind of bureaucratic oligarchy at this point. So at the top you have kind of the rich, powerful business interest and people in state administration competing for influence around the president. And the president relies primarily on the state administration, the bureaucracy, to implement policies that win out this kind of elite competition around Putin. So in this sense, Putin's kind of holding the ring between a lot of different sort of interest groups at the top who are fighting amongst themselves about things. And he appears to be the individual or the leader who can sort of referee them all or has been accepted as the referee who can do it. Uh, Putin, like Yeltsin, avoids identifying with any sort of single faction. And instead he tries to often present himself as above this kind of fray. And then he weighs in with this sort of deciding, you know, voice on what's going to happen. And these players at the top are in competition for his favor. And it's not just business, it's also people in government who want various policies pursued. It can be the security chiefs who are worried about various kinds of threats. It can be people in the defense ministry wanting spending on you know, new weapons or military reorganization. And it can be business interests arguing to Putin, we should do this for the good of the country, right? You know, more uh, natural gas sold to Germany, right? It generates more revenue. And, so you have this kind of fight at the top. The, now I'm starting to get kind of towards this idea of sort of Russian politics locked up a little bit. What this leads to is a very fluid kind of Kremlin politics rather than rule of law. And everything seems to defend, depend a lot on the personality of the referee at the top. And so you get these kind of minimal ties between the society at large and the court. <laughs> I stuck in that word kind of loaded from 1917, but you know, I think a lot of Russians I know, including friends of mine who are very well educated folks there, feel very disconnected from all these people running things at the top. That's not their problem. You know, there's a real sort of disengagement with some folks. Putin's divide and rule strategy fosters this kind of infighting and it enhances his authority, but it also means you get very, you get very decisive short-term decisions, but there's not a lot of long-term strategy coming out of this. There's nothing like the executive office of the president in the U.S. system here planning for 10 and 15 years down the road. Instead, there's a lot of sort of argument going on and then these very decisive sort of short-term policy choices. And the disconnection means that the government doesn't feel a whole lot of accountability towards the public and the public doesn't feel a lot of responsibility for what's going on. In 2004 there were protests over the benefits reform. Uh, the Russian government basically announced that instead of giving people um, like a subsidized public transport ticket and help with their rent and subsidized electric utilities and things. They were going to roll all these benefits up into one lump sum and give people just one amount of money each month. And when you did the numbers, it turned out that amount of money was not worth as much as getting your apartment voucher, the electricity and everything else. So a lot of older folks on fixed incomes hit the streets and started protesting. And they got quite, you know, upset about this. And the authorities at first seemed to, you know, send out the police and things, but the problem became, you know, you can't really truncheon or kettle people in their 70s and 80s on the street in front of the TV cameras. It looks really bad. And, you know, there was this sort of deadlock about what to do. 
So what happened? Putin suddenly weighed in and said, well, we'll reverse course. <laughs> and they put off doing all this. Well, this autumn coming up, that same proposal almost is up once again for consideration in the government, you know, now in 2012. So it postponed this, but so nothing's really been solved in that sense. Um, Putin has tried with this party of power thing that Yeltsin tried. Uh, the media has devoted a lot of attention to this United Russia youth movement called Nashi. I, I don't, I think it's a little overblown. I mean, most young people I've met who've ever done this just, you know, it wasn't, for a lot of people it wasn't that important. It was just, you know, it was a free concert, it was a free event, something like that. But what they seemed to think they needed was a lot of young people supporting the regime in case there was a color revolution like in Ukraine or Georgia or something. But even, but again, this hasn't been that effective. I mean, yes, they've had big rallies and stuff, but there doesn't seem to be a lot of substance to it. The government also created a so-called social chamber. If you saw the news today, uh, Russia's demanding that the USAID cut off funding for NGOs and support there. Well, there's now this official social chamber where all the officially registered NGOs go and meet in this chamber every so often with government officials. And the argument is this will help coordinate the work they do between government and NGOs. So it's created this kind of official NGO register. And if you're not on it, then you're not really a registered one. And the complaint lately has been that a lot of these NGOs are astroturf instead of grassroots. <laughs> Meaning they're kind of created from above, you know, they're, what does a social chamber need? We need a group concerned with urban poverty. Well, we've got to create an urban poverty NGO then or else somebody will make one, right? And so money's put up and, you know, headquarters are provided and you, and you create one of these things. So um, I should mention that there's a lot of material incentives, too, that come from the presidential administration. Uh, Masha Gessen has published a book. You can get, like, the Kindle version pretty cheaply called The Man Without a Face. And she's gotten in some hot water in Russia trying to look at corruption up at the top. And one of the things she talks about in the book is there's a part of the presidential administration called the Presidential Property Administration. <laughs> And it oversees this vast collection of cars and, and, and housing and all this other property that technically belongs to the office of the president, but often gets loaned out to members of parliament, to regional officials, to governors of some of the regions and things. So it's not all uh, sticks. It's, there are carrots as well from the Putin administration, but the sticks get more attention, like when Mikhail Kordakovsky, who ran Yukos Oil, um, one of the things Putin can often hold over the large business interests there is this threat of going back and looking at people's taxes and things like this. And Kordakovsky in the mid-2000s had said he was going to use some of his billions to create a new political party. Well, suddenly his taxes are audited back the last 10 years and oh, he made these various mistakes and, thing, and he's been in the court system ever since. And uh, I believe it was um, Batista of Cuba who once said, for my friends, everything, for my enemies, the law. <laughs> and this has become kind of a trend that there's a lot of selective law enforcement going on here. People that kind of cross, um, you know, the interest of the government tend to get in a lot of trouble. Just this past week, Gennady Gutkov was expelled from the Russian Duma, which means he lost his parliamentary immunity. And the trouble he got in is he's a member of a group called Just Russia, meaning like a just Russia, like justice for Russia, just Russia. Just Russia seems to have been created by the Kremlin to be an opposition group uh, back in the 2000s. It suddenly came from nowhere, it was well financed, and said it was an opposition group that still voted sometimes with the government. Um, Gudkov called, and there's some other people in Just Russia who have said that they need to be a real opposition party. And he pushed really hard on this, and Gudkov actually uh, participated in a lot of the big demonstrations you've seen on TV lately, and he couldn't be arrested because he has parliamentary immunity. So he was very visible at them. Well, he's been investigated for operating a business while serving as a member of the Duma. 
And this is, again, selective law enforcement. This would be kind of like looking at our U.S. senators and saying, hey, it turns out you're a millionaire sitting here, you know. <laughs> There's a lot of people in the Duma in Russia that own and operate some kind of business on the side. But, you know, the bricks have come down on him, and he's being basically kicked out. So the difference between Yeltsin and Putin seems to be that Putin feels he's relying on these patriots in the sort of state bureaucracy as opposed to the greedy business oligarchs of the Yeltsin era. But increasingly, people in Russia, including these demonstrators you see, argue that what's happened instead is the state bureaucrats have become the new oligarchs. That now if you want to do business there, you've got to be connected to government. That's the only people that can, that can operate, so to speak. And so you see Russia doing really poorly in various uh, listings of, of, criminal, of, of corruption. So in 2008, the question became, what would Putin do? He ended up endorsing Medvedev here as his successor to the presidency, he, and Putin moved to the prime minister position. Because again, the president of Russia can nominate any Russian citizen to be prime minister so long as the Duma then approves him. Putin doesn't have to be a member of the legislature to be the prime minister. So he moves over to that position. And some of the Russian papers that criticized him said this was pulling a Slobodan, like Slobodan Milosevic, the former ruler in Yugoslavia, who, when he could no longer be president, became prime minister for a while. And so it, it was not well received in that sense. And the question then became, you know, is he tapping Medvedev to succeed him like Yeltsin tapped Putin, or is Medvedev keeping his seat warm till 2012? And the answer slowly emerged that it was keeping his seat warm. <laughs> and there was a lot of like official scrutiny of how well they were getting along, were there any signs of arguments between them? Because some uh, more liberal leaning segments of the political spectrum there were hoping Medvedev once in office might step up and sort of assume the mantle of successor and maybe he would slowly push Putin aside, but it didn't, didn't happen. And instead, 2012, Putin announces he's going to run again and at the big shindig at United Russia, they say, oh, and we planned it this way all along. And all the folks who had tried to kind of cut Medvedev some slack in the liberal press and stuff felt really betrayed about this. The other thing that changed while Putin was in the prime minister position is the Russian constitution has been amended. The term of the presidency now is six years. And so now you can serve two successive six-year terms as president. So theoretically then, Putin, who got elected in 2012, can remain in office until... And this return by Putin has not been a success. And I think the early signs included almost immediately he announced that he was going to create this thing called the All Russian People's Front. So once again, the party of power has failed. <laughs> we get yet another attempt to create some kind of party that supports the government. There have been these large anti-regime sort of demonstrations, but they've been in Moscow and, Lin and St. Petersburg mostly, not, not all over the country. These demonstrations started, this banner calls for clean elections. These demonstrations started in 2012 in part because people caught on their cell phone cameras, right, and posted on YouTube evidence of electoral fraud in the 2012 elections. And the um, government I, was, very, was caught very much by surprise at how effective these sort of grassroots attempts to monitor the elections were. And a lot of people got involved in analyzing them to show corruption. These guys that are statisticians at Moscow State showed that for the returns to be plausible in Chechnya, you would have had to have had a turnout of 102%. <laughs> so everybody knows there was, you know, things going on. The opposition also has increasingly been voicing this widespread discontent with corruption. Alexei Navalny is a very visible person in it. He started a blog about corruption in Russia that's turned into kind of a 
a popular website and things. And he started this in part because of his own experience of trying to open a business in Russia and being shook, shook down for money, for bribes, for licenses, and things like this. And he's coined this popular slogan that United Russia is the party of swindlers and thieves. And people have started like photoshopping and like uh, sort of culture jamming the United Russia's logos into this. So this says the party of swindlers and thieves, but it looks kind of like an official poster from them. And uh, the symbol of Putin's party is the bear, right? You know, good patriotic symbol. But uh, they've increasingly shown it with the bear hauling off the goods or the bear with his hands in the ballot box like a honey jar or something like that. So there's been this kind of popular slogan about it. Um, and corruption there has changed. In the 1990s, there's this sort of slang that to do business, you had to have a roof, Krisha, over your head. In the 90s, that was usually a crime group. So the state was weak, the courts were not reliable, the courts took years to have a civil lawsuit heard. If, you, if someone broke a business contract, you're going to pursue them in court for eight years. Or, in the 90s, you could turn to informal groups for assistance, and they would go collect debts and things like that. Well, that has largely been swept away. But the complaint in Russia now is that serious business now, you have to have a government connection, or else the government can just come take it from you. You've you got to have the protection of a patron in government to do business. And that protection protects you from the tax police, from paying lots of bribes to various members of the bureaucracy. My colleague, Misha Blinikoff at St. Cloud State, Dr. Blinikoff, he's in the geography department. He's been looking at these suburbs around Moscow, these little micro mansions that are popping up everywhere in these gated communities. And they're always advertised as being sold to foreign businessmen like expatriates. But he's been slowly finding evidence that instead, a lot of people living in them are Russian state officials, <laughs> like kind of in the middle ranks. And their state salaries don't really explain why, why they can afford it. So why do I say Russia's kind of getting at a dead end? I, at the moment, I don't really know what to expect next. If we think about Putin's options, he could stay in office for the next six years, relying increasingly, I guess, on administrative resources, right, to tamp down the opposition and keep them quiet, but for what end? I mean, what's the kind of end game of it? He could try to again create some sort of electable party of power, but we've seen consistently from the 90s through the 2000s in Russia that has not worked for whoever the sitting president or leader is. Or he could choose a real successor, unlike a placeholder, and do what Yeltsin did, perhaps, and just sort of turn things over to this person. But again, how effective will that be politically sort of a second or third time? In a lot of ways, people feel like they were fooled with Medvedev. Could he somehow signal, no, this time it's for real, this guy's really going to replace me? And of course, there's the lame duck problem, right? In the United States, we talk about lame duck presidents. Once you're getting towards the end of your term, you're not coming back your power starts to decline. Well, if he's the ring holder in the system, if he starts signaling he's going to retire, you know, what happens at the top? Will there be a big falling out? Also, where does strengthening the vertical of power stop? Finally, in 2009, after a bunch of independent mayoral candidates defeated United Russia candidates, some United Russia members of the Duma introduced a bill so that basically mayors would start becoming appointed. In the 1990s, governors were elected in Russia. They're now appointed by the president and confirmed by the state legislature, the federal legislature of the region. Well, they're now saying they're gonna roll this back because, I mean, at some point it starts becoming absurd. You know, how can you micromanage a federal system this huge? Um, and I would argue that, you know, the Kremlin, I think, is, or Putin's regime is starting to realize that the country is too vast, it's too educated, it's too technologically connected to the world to just be able to micromanage it like that. Um, 
I mean, if you look at the, you know, the Arab Spring situation where you had people working for Google in California and then going home and confronting these authoritarian regimes. Um, Russia has a huge population that's been educated abroad, travels abroad, does business abroad, and the idea you're just going to get them to fall in line with this. On the other hand, I'm not sure what the opposition's options are. They can, can continue these really big, large-scale demonstrations, but they've had trouble getting them to catch on beyond Moscow and St. Petersburg. And Putin has seized on that lately in his statements and his aides. Um, uh, Skirkov talked, well, was giving an interview a while back, and he was asked about this big demonstration in Moscow, and he was like, yeah, these Muscovite liberals put down their laptops at Starbucks and went outside and <laughs> marched around. And it's almost like he's trying to introduce a kind of class sort of thing to it, making it sound like these are these privileged elites in the two major cities, right, doing this. So, and I don't know if that'll work, but uh, at state television has often tried to kind of pitch these events like that, that it's these sort of disgruntled, you know, um, yuppie types, I guess you could say, in Moscow, St. Petersburg, doing this. But if they keep up demonstrations, what's the point of them? Are you trying to bring down the regime through people power in the streets? If you're going to do that, then you're going to have to have much larger ones everywhere. Are you instead trying to get some elites like Gutkoff there to defect to the opposition? And maybe, I mean, that might be a strategy. Or do you try to start a new grassroots party from below in a country as big as Russia and start that slow slog of winning local elections at the provincial level across this vast place, you know? So I don't really know uh, what direction the opposition is thinking of going in. And so this is why I worry there's kind of this dead end that we're starting to get to in Russian politics. I don't really see the regime coming up with an ideology that integrates the citizenry back kind of into supporting government that much. And the corruption levels are very high and that's proving very corrosive to state legitimacy. And um, on the other hand, what are the options from outside? So this has sort of become my worry lately about where Russia's heading. So I guess I'll stop there and take some questions. Okay, um, I'm going to have him begin to take your questions here in a couple minutes, but I just wanted to remind you that this was just the first in a series of programs, and you will get uh, notice on the upcoming ones. I'll just preview uh, next week's program, which is also on uh, Tuesday night, on the 25th. Um, that one will be at St. John's in uh, the Centenary Room, Quad 264 at 730. Um, I'll be moderating a panel discussion on the role of foreign policy issues in the U.S. presidential election. The focus of the program really is what kind of foreign policy issues will the new president uh, taking office in January face? It's not so much the politics of foreign policy in the elections, but more what are the real issues out there that uh, the president needs to be uh, addressing. And it'll be uh, two retired U.S. Foreign Service officers, Dick Verdon, who is our resident uh, diplomat, um, and uh, Tom Hansen uh, from University of Minnesota Duluth. And they're both uh, people who have followed these issues closely and speak in many different venues, and they will share your thoughts, their thoughts with you in the program next, uh, next Tuesday evening. So I hope that uh, most of you will be able to um, follow continue this series and, and join us for that uh, program. In October, we will be having Raghi Assad from the Humphrey Institute, who will be coming to talk about uh, Egypt uh, after the Arab Spring, which I think promises to be a very uh, uh, interesting and enlightening program. So with that, we have um, uh, about uh, 20, 25 minutes left uh, to take some questions. So um, it is open, and I'll turn it to you to acknowledge people. And, uh, okay. Any, anyone can jump in? Yeah. 
Uh, what role do you see the collective memory and experience from the Soviet era playing in the inability for the people of Russia to gain political movement with, with different parties and things like that? Um, I don't know. I'm, you know, a lot of times I get asked about kind of, you know, the historical weight on the, you know. on the one hand as a political scientist I want to say, well, this is a political system and you take it apart like a machine and look at the structures and things, but um, I think, you know, um, so I, I, on the one hand I, I kind of worry about sort of emphasizing all this history and making Russia sound like it's some really, uh, you know, even more unique case or something. Um, Daniel Treisman's written a book uh, called The Return. We're using it in my Russia class and Treisman kind of polemically makes this argument that Russia should be approached more like any other political system with kind of middle economic development and, and these other things. But on the other hand, I do think it's true that there's a lot of um, um, shall we say, uh, disaffection with the idea of politics. There's a lot, I mean, politics there has a lot of negative connotations. It does in the U.S. for some folks too, but the idea of getting involved in it, the idea of being a sh mover and shaker in politics and things there, there is kind of a burden to overcome the idea that you're going to do something positive with that. There, there is sort of that burden there. Uh, I have to say that the Communist Party of the Russian Federation, the KPRF, the kind of reformed Reds that are still around, bless their hearts, they're often some of the only folks that voice much dissent <laughs> to what's going on. Uh, a, a, couple, a good example, a couple of years ago, um, President Medvedev introduced a bill on the Duma to change the name of the Russian police back to Polizia from Militia, the kind of Soviet name that had been used. And he wanted them to get new uniforms and change the names on the squad cars and everything. And so they introduced this bill, United Russia was getting ready to rubber stamp it, and a member of the KPRF in his mid-70s took the platform and said, well, wait a minute, how much is this going to cost? <laughs> We've got a budget to balance. <laughs> So you had like, you know, a member of the Communist Party of Russian Federation saying, you know, what about the economic balance of the, you know, how much debt is this going to run up, changing the names of the police? We've got other things to... So, I mean, in a way, the political lines of the past are kind of blurred in a lot of strange ways. In some ways, the KPRF are the opposition now, you know. But that does give, that does make it hard for them to appeal to younger people because they're, they're seen as tied to the past to some extent. So uh, Russia has been quite obstinate in a lot of international negotiations, for example, on the crisis in Syria and on Iran. So I'm kind of wondering, is that outside pressure also having an effect on Putin? Or in some ways, is Putin's obstinance and independence kind of a reflection of this kind of leadership from the top within Russia? Um, yeah. I. My view of it is that it is kind of a reflection of the fact that on some things Putin can say, none of you have a say on this because it's national security. And so I think he does have a, he and um, his sort of um, advisors that run foreign policy have a freer hand in that sense to set it. And if they're criticized a lot on it, they can say, well, but you guys are worried about your oil interests, you guys are worried, we're worried about the the nation. Syria is very strange in a lot of ways because um, a lot of people say to me they're, they're still supporting Syria because they sell weapons to them, but they're not making that much, the, the amount of money they're making from Syria on weapons sales or in the past, it's not that much. I think instead it seems to be an idea of keeping a hand in the Middle East, of still having a role there. Um, a, a couple of advisors to Putin uh, three or four years ago, um, it, what was reported in the newspapers there, argued that if uh, Russia really wanted a lot of influence in the Middle East, they should build bridges back to the Russian ethnic community in Israel. <laughs> All the immigrants there who have created political parties there and are very influential and stuff, and the argument was, you know, um, they still have a lot of cultural ties to Russia. That would be a, a group we could... And instead, there's, uh, Putin still seems to sort of see the Middle East as this 
kind of chessboard and Syria is this useful ally and they, they're not willing to let them go. And I think some of that's his perception of balancing the U.S. and the region. But. I want to understand what happened because, um, you know, George W. Bush had met Putin and they had looked into each other's eyes and it seemed like they had found some, you know, understanding. And now we're talking of Russia being a major threat in election, you know, campaign. So what has happened in this last uh, eight, nine years to move from, you know, Russia being an ally to, or at least not, you know, having a good relationship to this? Because Russia supported U.S. right after 9-11. You know, we couldn't have won a, uh, the Talib over Taliban without Russian support, you know, in that first war. So. Um, well, um, I, again, I think Putin <laughs> can be charming when he wants to be. <laughs> and he is a very effective politician when he wants to be. I mean, if you see him on Russian television with a crowd connecting with them, he, he can do this. So. You know, I don't know how he charmed uh, President, former President Bush particularly. Um, the rhetoric from the current campaign about Russia being this threat, I find kind of weird, actually. I mean, there are a lot of areas of disagreement, but I don't see what the idea is that they're somehow emerging again. It seems very odd. Um, Russia does a lot of trade with the European Union. Uh, so they have a lot of trade issues with the EU, not so much with us. So I find it, the rhetoric of it a little odd. Uh, as far as uh, Russia and the U.S. run after 9-11, I think there was a lot of cooperation. But that was also useful in a way because Putin then argued the situation in Chechnya, these are basically international jihadists as well, and we're going to shut them down. And he tied, very quickly tied the situation there into this larger idea. And so, yes, initially there was a lot of uh, this talk. Chechnya now is quieter. I didn't get a chance to talk about why. And there's not as much of this kind of linkage. It's not as needed for them. Yeah. Yeah, he, he's one of his officials in the social chamber now is like uh, kind of this official liaison with the church. Well, one of the things I didn't totally unpack when I was talking about kind of Putinism lacking an ideological sort of argument, there have been attempts to, especially by Putin's government, to try and reforge some kind of link with the Orthodox Church and kind of reestablish it as a state church there. Um, and, and that's been going on. There are problems with doing it, though. Uh, one is that, although in a lot of public opinion polling, most Russians would say, for their religious affiliation, orthodox, they also often indicate, but I'm not practicing. You know, the, the number of people who actually are very active in it are, is smaller, and that's a legacy of the Soviet period in part. So there's that. The other difficulty is trying to create this really strong link to the Orthodox Church in a country that is multi-ethnic. A lot of times we don't realize how much diversity there is in Russia with you know, the regions in the south having Islam as a major religion and, and other groups. So there's been this sort of experimentation, if you will, but it's never gone that far. And I don't know how far it can go in a contemporary society like Russia's. I don't know how much influence the church could gain back over a society that's that secular in a lot of ways and that plugged into the broader kind of global scene. But there has been some attempts to cultivate it. Russia, so how would they go back to the United? It was possible. It was possible at all. 
I think there have been attempts to do so, and there have been many kind of false starts to do so. And part of the problem every time has been the regime has tried to sabotage them and come up with all kinds of, you know, obstacles to it. Um, the Gary Kasparov, the famous chess player from Russia, tried to start a movement called the Other Russia, and he went around Russia and tried to visit smaller towns and the countryside and things. And he had this idea that, you know, he would try to connect together people that are not in Moscow and Petersburg, but are kind of outside the power circles there. And he would go to towns and they would tell him, oh, the building you booked is, is reserved for something else. And he tried to give a talk in one town and the power went out, you know, and, and he was flying to a different region to give a speech and his plane was held on the tarmac for three hours and then it was clear to go. And, and so, I mean, there have been a lot of attempts to do so. And unfortunately, when I talk about kind of the big picture in Russia, I have to present a lot of negatives. There, there are a lot of people on the ground there trying to do the right thing, trying to do really positive things locally. But at the moment, the regime seems really paranoid or hostile to these efforts, unless they co-opt them, you know, unless it becomes one of these NGOs that willingly joins the social chamber and falls in line. So I think it's possible, but there's so many obstacles in the way. You know, I think in the long term, obviously, it would be better for Putin <laughs> if he had a real opposition to run against. Um, you know, but and in the election against Medvedev in 2008, the uh, one of the candidates wanted to drop out, and she says later she was told, "No, you can't. <laughs> you got to stay in and run against him." because they were worried everybody would drop out and just be Medvedev facing unopposed in the national election. So they, they, there needs to be an opposition, but there are so many obstacles the regime puts up in its way. And now they're cutting off you know, funding from abroad for NGOs. This is just another kind of hurdle. So now if you're gonna start an NGO up there, you're gonna have to raise money locally, you know, which could be a good thing. You could get a lot of people on board, but there's not a lot of money to raise in some regions. Russia and St. Petersburg are very well off sort of GNP per capita wise, but when you leave the major cities of Russia and go in the countryside, you go further out, there's quite a steep step between those kind of world cities and then, you know, provincial towns. A couple of my friends were like emailing me like, well, you know, I'm going to vote for, uh, yeah. Um, I don't, see this is the other thing that's happening is that diffusing the opposition, I mean, opposition's allowed, but they want it to be, you know, Gennady Zuganov, the guy of the KPRF who's run, you know, a million times. They want it to be someone who's not a real contender. So I don't know what I would have done. Um, the under the Yeltsin Constitution, there used to be the option to check none of the above against all. And in the 1990 elections, there was always that box. In the 2000s, it was removed because in some local elections, especially up to 20% of the people voting started checking against all candidates. And, and they actually started worrying that they would have an election, right, where people would get so fed up with this, they would... so. I don't know. I, it, it was a very difficult position, I think, for people to be in. A number of my friends were like, uh, two of my friends actually, who should be like, you know, voting for, I don't know, some kind of really liberal, progressive group there. They used to vote for Yabloka or something like that. They ended up voting for the KPRF. And I said, why? And they said, well, at least they're a real opposition. <laughs> at least they're a real party, you know. So that's, that's kind of, that's again why I'm talking about this kind of dead end situation. I mean, that's where some people have ended up at. Um, in the 1990s, I was in Russia and I was talking to some friends of mine in the kitchen and I started telling them about how I pay my taxes in the U.S. and they were rolling on the floor laughing at me. 
<laughs> they were like, the government sends you a form, Jason, and you write on the form where you live and how much you made and you report all your income and you make sure you counted it all up correctly and you tell them and then you calculate it out. Don't pay it. <laughs> I said, you have to pay it. They can't arrest all of you. <laughs> Don't pay it. Uh, Again, if you have a weak state, right, I mean, on the one hand, the state's strong, Putin can take decisive action. On the other hand, the kind of infrastructure of the state's weak, collecting taxes across all this region. So in the 90s, the government would crack down really hard on, like, corporations that didn't pay tax, right, the big fish, so to speak. Now there's a, just wherever you're paid, you pay a flat kind of tax out of your paycheck now in Russia. But there are lots of people who get paid in cash and who get paid in the non-formal economy who are not paying taxes. Sure, absolutely. And what does the Russian government do? It goes after banks, big companies, employers for tax. Not, it doesn't have the resources to go after everybody. So again, you have kind of a weak state in that sense, still. U.S. is a strong state. I don't pay my taxes. I, they'll find it. but. Um, I know that last year Putin <coughs> proposed the creation of a Eurasian Union, which a lot of people said was a disguised attempt at recreating the Soviet Union. Um, I'm just curious what your thoughts on that. Um, my opinion is Russia does not want to recreate the Soviet Union. Uh, I had a picture of Anatoly Chubias in one of the slides. He's kind of an old political fixer there now. Uh, Chubias was once quoted as saying, uh, the, Bel uh, the Russian rubles worth, you know, 20 to the dollar at the time. If we absorbed Belarus, Belarus it'd be worth two th it'd be 2,000 rubles to the dollar. And what he meant was he, Russia didn't want to absorb a country even sort of worse off economically in trying to deal with its problems. Yeltsin, a bunch of Yeltsin's advisors in the 90s urged him on what they called a Russia first policy. As a union was disintegrating, and they argued with Yeltsin, we'd be better off without Central Asia. We'd be better off without trying to fix, you know, all the problems of Ukraine, you know, Russia first, worry about it. Now, Putin and the regime want good trade relations with the former Soviet Union. And they want it to be very easy to do business there. And they want Ukrainians using Russian cell phone companies and Russian banks and things. But they do not want the burdens or responsibility of governing an even larger area than they have. So uh, when I'm in Ukraine now, uh, last time I was in Ukraine, there were a lot of ads there where one of the Russian phone companies now has service there too, and they'll let you roam for free inside Ukraine and Russia on your phone, you know, and there's a lot of banks across border and stuff. So Russia wants to sell goods there. They want to do business there. They want that to be an economic space that they're competitive in, but they do not want the overhead of actually being the government of these regions. Okay, I think we've run out of time. Yeah, we've, we've okay. come to the 75 minutes that we uh, try to allot. So we have other things that you folks need to do. Uh, if you, any of you do have remaining questions, I'm sure our speaker won't be leaving immediately, so please do uh, come up and uh, engage him uh, informally. But I thank you for coming and hope to see uh, most of you next uh, Tuesday night for the panel discussion on uh, U.S. foreign policy issues. But thanks an awful lot for coming.